Bravo. Very nice that you all stayed. Um, so I'm Alistair Sporting. I'm the artistic director here at Sadler's Wells, and I have Mark Morris beside me. Woo! I also have Ethan Iverson, who uh, did all the arrangements and played tonight. We have Lauren Grant, who was one of the dancers. And Domingo Estrada, who is another one of the dancers. So, um, this is a little bit unusual tonight because, as well as uh, you lovely people here, we have a worldwide audience on Facebook Live. Um, and they're really lovely. They're lovely. <laughs> and uh, the reason we're doing that is because um, this is just the beginning of a tour of uh, the Mark Morris Dance Group. Um, they will be in the UK um, for many weeks to come. Um, I was going to say, until we leave... No, I won't say that. <laughs> For many weeks to come in this turbulent time, but they will bring joy to the UK and to many cities around the uh, country. So all of the uh, joining uh, venues are having their live uh, Facebook live on their website. So that's going out to all of those people. So there will be all, uh, questions from you, but there will also be questions from the people out there on Facebook. And Rosanna will tell, Rosanna is there and she will tell us when we have a question from the Facebook people. So I'm going to ask a few questions of my own and then, and then I'll hand over to you. And um, so Mark, Yes. First one is about the commission, because um, you were, this was a commission, so that's pretty unusual for you, is it, to, be, to have a specific commission about something? Does that happen very often to you? No. Um, I'm commissioned to do stuff by uh, uh, theaters and producers who want me to do something, but they never really get to say what it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I won't do something I hate. Yeah. Good advice, everyone. Don't do much that you do enough that you can then do what you like after that. So um, no, it was the the idea of Sean Doran who was who put together the festival in Liverpool. I don't know whatever whenever the fifth was that two years ago or something. Years it was ago, forever. Yeah. I don't know. It was a while ago for the fiftieth anniversary of the release of this album, mm -hmm. which was please remember only an album and never a live show, never a touring show, just yeah. a studio thing. Mm -hmm. So he. Uh, I've known him for a long time and he's great and he asked me if I would do it and I was very much unsure if I would because I don't listen to the Beatles all day long. I'm sorry Beatles, but I don't listen to them all day long. Well, that's what I was going to ask you because, you know, how did you react to that idea? I mean, did you have an affinity? You obviously, so you didn't have an affinity with them. No, I didn't say that, Alistair. What happened was I didn't listen to it every day since I was, you know, 10 or 12 or something. I loved it. I, like everybody else, had a giant crush on Paul McCartney, of course. And I loved the music for a while, but I wasn't that much into popular music in general. I was, it wasn't like the Rolling Stones instead. For me, it was just like, what is this interesting music? So I loved it. And you can't escape it, whether you want to or not. It's always playing. And you know it. So when he asked me to do this, I was like, well, let me check. It's been like 30 years since I listened to that. Yeah. And so I listened to it, and I really liked it, which was a relief because we decided to do the show from that. Okay. And then uh, you didn't just uh, play the... It's rather complicated working with this material, isn't it, um, musically, because there are very restric various restrictions over it, but you decided to do something very unusual with the musical arrangement. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, the thing about this material is it's everyone's folklore at this point. At this point, you know, if you're a human, if you're a Western human, maybe I should say, you know, you're already an expert in the Beatles and an expert in Sgt. Pepper. So I think both Mark and I knew that we didn't need to explain what the record was in this work, but instead we could use it as a, a piece of folk material that everyone understood, not unlike there's like a new production of Hamlet and okay, well, do something incredibly revolutionary with this material everybody understands. That's more the uh, perspective I think we had coming into it. 
and uh, quite an unusual arrangement of instruments too, including the theremin, of course. Maybe you should explain what the theremin is. Well, everybody's mad about the theremin, and everybody forgets, I'm sorry to say, the gentleman, Rob Schwimmer, who plays the theremin is fabulous, but every single th person playing in the pit is a super genius. It's just that everyone's so shocked and horrified by the sci-fi aspect of the fabulous theremin. Go on, Ethan. Well, you know, I was Mark's music director for five years, and one of the things Mark really opened me up to was the wonderful world of obscure and abstract music played by crazy people. <laughs> Someone like Harry Parch. I mean, if you think theremin is bad, you know, let's just try to do a Harry Parch opera. You know what I mean? <laughs> but um, there's a lot of stuff I learned back then about embracing something, something between world music and something between experimental and something between folk that's key to Morris's aesthetic. And uh, I saw Rob Schwimmer play Bach in, at a concert, and I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard. And like the next week, I called Mark and I said, man, I found a musician for you. You will like this musician. And then that was before I knew about Pepperland. And when Pepperland came down, I was like, OK, that's it. We've got to get Rob in there for Mark. And how closely do you work together after that when you're composing and thinking about structures? Every day, you talk every day, work well, in the studio together? One thing I thought was that I was supposed to do the whole album. Oops. Uh -huh. um, I was intended to do like one number, but I couldn't stop, so we did, what is it, six that we do that he arranged? But I um, we decided to do it, he agreed to do it. I only work with living musicians. And so to choose the numbers, to try and get the rights, and to start work, because it was a very short turnaround. Yeah. So I started, I started rehearsing in the studio with the recording and with just counting and just ideas, and he was working from the same source. It, we had to work pretty fast. Yeah. And uh, that was sort of stressful, but also meant you just had to produce, you know? Mm, OK. So Lauren, Domingo. Uh, you probably used to dancing to different kinds of music, but this is this is a very different challenge, isn't it? It's a different kind of world and different beat. And how did how did it feel for you? Well, there's a lot that we love about that. Um, there's a blues number, and uh, each of us takes a solo, and uh, we're just going with what's happening in the pit, which is also, I think, somewhat improvisatory. So you don't know what's gonna happen. You get out there, you hear it, you do something, and it's completely on the spot within the structure that Mark gave us. So it's a very live, very vibrant uh, moment and experience. Um, and I, you know, we feel that immediacy, and hopefully the audience does as well. So there's nothing pat about it. And as Ethan was saying about the musical arrangement being more of a folk bass and geared toward how Mark works, um, and all of the works that he has choreographed uh, prior to the Beatles and this one uh, in particular, especially with the groovy um, compilation of music. Uh, it, it's very fun and we get in tune with how the arrangement is by each section and with Mark's work and it becomes very natural and fun. There's something also um, v similar to everything we do with Mark because musically uh, everything's very interesting and the way Mark treats the music and has the dance set to the music. Uh, it's not just uh, the same beat, but we're doing different things all the time and counterpoint and canon. And so all of that is in here in the same deep way that it might be in, in uh, something we do to Mozart. And, and Ethan's also given some great challenges in like when I'm 64, I think is there a three, a four, and a five happening simultaneously. Yes. And at first that was quite challenging for the dancers to be able to dance to that. And the more we practiced and the more Mark and Ethan, I think, helped us hear that and move to that, we got better and we can just do that. I'm not sure a lot of dancers can do that, but the way that we work with Mark and the way he trains us, we're somehow able to get to that point. Yeah, that looked pretty tricky, that moment. You know, I have, I have something to say about the dancers, actually, because uh, I first started to play for Mark for dance class. And I played for dance class a lot over the years. And once in a while, I still do. And I can tell, even though there's no sound in a dance class, I can tell how good the rhythm of the dancers are, just the feeling in the room. 
And it's always a pleasure to play for the Mark Morris dancers because the rhythm is so good. Nice. That's great. Rhythm is not as popular as I would like it to be. <laughs> One last question for you, Mark, actually, okay. is, then, is then how you, uh, why, why you set this kind of West Coasty? Is it West Coasty? The, the design and the look, the sunglasses? Um, no. <laughs> Where is it then? The designs are, the colors and the cuts of the costumes are absolutely Carnaby Street. They're entirely mod. They're sourced from that. Absolutely, certainly they are. Okay. And the, the period, it's post, it's pre-hippie. The, the, I messed up with the sunglasses. Those are to represent um, the government of North Korea and the fascist, the fascist governments that people were rebelling against during the time of the Vietnam War. So it was, it's, it's related to that. But also, please remember, um, what is what's this called? Um, English people, people of Great Britain, people of England and Ireland, people who are proud of everything and so thrilled that... Beatlemania, as it was termed, was way bigger in the States just because there are more people. That's all. Okay. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. That's what I'm here for. So, yeah. Um, okay. It's over to you. Uh, we have a Facebook question straight away. Rosanna. Um, Bridget from the Dance Consortium Facebook page is asking, what has been your favorite aspect of working on Pepperland? My favorite, well, I'm sorry, but my favorite aspect of it is that I'm done and it's a hit and I get to watch it every night. So I'm done with that, but, you know, I just, I'm here for the ride and to watch it and to keep track of it. And others, you can yeah, join cool. in. I'm going back to this not being a, a work that is very similar to any of Mark's other works. He works in very classical music and working on operas. So it's a lot of fun and energetic and very vibrant for us as dancers in a way that we like to dance socially uh, and it's incorporated in this dance. I don't know what to say anything. Well, I have a cliche I say about this. This is like a riff, a prepared riff, essentially. I say it a lot of the interviews, but there's a lot of social action you know, maybe connected to things like Facebook, and that's, that's really great. And there's a lot of art that's determined to tell us about the problems of our planet, and that's undoubtedly very important, but I'm very happy in Pepperland that it has absolutely no redeeming value, <laughs> that it's politically just what it is, and we just want everybody to feel joy at the end. You know? okay. That's great. <laughs> We need that. So why the choice of instruments? And did, has Paul McCartney seen it? I don't think Mr. McCartney is interested in seeing Beatles projects exactly. That's my suspicion anyway. Maybe he'll show up. It's possible. Mr. Starr, too. I saw him at the Wolseley once. <laughs> but I, Mark him. said in another interview, this, this question has come up, it, and Mark said, this, you know, this piece isn't for the Beatles, the remaining Beatles. And that's true. Pepperland is not for, for Paul and Ringo, probably. It's for Yoko Ono. <laughs> now, if she came, I'd be psyched. Exactly. That, I would be, that, that would be cool. Uh, instruments. Oh, instruments. Yeah. Uh, again, a lot of Mark's work that I saw, it seemed like it was very specific to people and specific to idiom. And if someone was... A genius, you should try to hire them and work around them. That's also sort of an American music ethos. Uh, Duke Ellington, almost my number one hero, he said, the composition has begun when the instrumentalists are chosen. And so I had certain people that I wanted to work with, Rob being one of them. Uh, everyone in the pit is ex extraordinary, and that's, that's sort of how this particular chamber ensemble came to be, was just you know, let's, let's, let's get the best and the brightest and the most weird and then proceed from there. This is a question for Lauren and Domingo. What is it that you love about dance? Oh, I mean, aren't we just born wanting to move and to, to, to a rhythm, you know, and then we lose that. You know, Mark always talks about how little kids, they want to skip to go somewhere. They don't want to walk. You know, it's more fun. And then that somehow gets sucked out of us and we sit at computers or we sit at our desks or we sit in a car or we sit on the couch. Um, so I feel lucky 
that I get to do this. And I, I teach a lot, and I always tell my students how lucky they are. You know, they, they could be doing something else entirely, but what a joy to move to music. And then what a, an even greater joy to do that for Mark, who has this amazing vision in the way that he uh, synthesizes the, the sound and the movement. Uh, and so it's a very nourishing experience for me. It's challenging. He, he, um, he, he pushes us to grow, not to just be caricatures of ourselves. <laughs> that would be very easy to do. So I get to change as an artist as I work with him, always. And I think that changes who I am as a person. So I love it. As for me, I just like to cut loose. <laughs> but to expand on that, um, I, I, I really enjoy dance because I've always been a mover um, with athletics and then found dancing as I got older. Um, but I'm also a creature of habit, and so I love discipline and the discipline of dance um, and the creativity uh, and the expression that comes with the art. Uh, and Mark has a wonderful way of giving that to all of us so that we can be satisfied with our career and our passions. Yeah, so we're talking about the... Um, when, I'm 64. when I'm 64. So you're talking about that, uh, <coughs> the, those cross rhythms. Tell us about what was going on there, Evan, and how cruel it was to make <laughs> these dancers do that. I want to say something about that. A friend who danced, I danced with her, I don't know, many decades ago, a wonderful dancer, came to see this show, and she said, watching it, she's about my age, can we say, pushing 64. And... <laughs> Uh, you know, because the one option would have been, you know, show, you know, a, follow the bouncing ball, a giant mob of people drinking a pint and weeping as they sing along karaoke style with uh, When I'm 64. That would make a lot of money for a festival if you wanted to do that. But we didn't, and he'll tell you why. But she watched this and said that watching that dance, the way it starts one way and then changes and sort of deteriorates, she said it was a, per this is sad, she said it was a perfect sort of metaphor for getting old. <laughs> Go ahead, Ethan. <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, I think swing is very important. And it's very important to American jazz. And when I'm 64, that's sort of like music hall. That's just an echo of American jazz in that. And it, in a certain way, you, you can't double down on swing. You know, you can if you're playing the Village Vanguard with a, with a great jazz drummer, but if you're out here playing for dance, more like musical theater, what you actually maybe want to do is carve out more abstract rhythms. You know, and that in the intellectual gamesmanship of that, it actually starts to swing another kind of swing, you know, but we're hoping it's engaging. I'm very sorry about the headache. Yeah, so the question is about the silver foil, and apparently there are no mountains in Liverpool. There are mountains near Liverpool, but not in Liverpool. Mark, what's going on? You said silver foil. How did you know that? It's true. Here's, this is very simple. This set was designed by the very, very great scenic designer, Johan Henkens, who's Bravo. known for Bravo. a lot of his theater work over the last decade. You can look him up. Um, and here's the story. When we were going to go to, to uh, Liverpool to do the festival, I said, oh, by the way, can I have a set, please? It was like, well, no, sorry. There's no time, and there's no money, and there's no money to ship it. You know, I wanted like a spiral staircase and a fountain and a <laughs> chandelier and a helicopter and video monitors and, you know, the usual. And so, okay, good, I want to catch up there. Um, so I want something super shiny like the uh, proto-fascist reflective sunglasses that eliminate personality, but also relate to kaleidoscope eyes uh, looking, no, looking glass eyes, kaleidoscope, whatever. You know all the songs, you can source that material. So I wanted something that was shiny and kind of reflective and, you know, psychedelic a little bit. It wasn't um, originally intended to be what it's become, which is a little bit of a mountain range. So it's secretly, I was looking at different materials. It's, this, is, this is the secret, but it's the truth, which is it's comprised of a little frame of wood and those blankets that if you're dying of hypothermia after running a marathon, <laughs> it comes in a, 
packet the size of a little tissue packet and it opens up to human size and that's why it looks like uh, what we call the, the Alps of this piece, um, we call this pepper horn, just so you know. And we're aware that there, it's not very mountainous in Liverpool. It's an austerity set. Yeah, cheap. Yeah, yeah so the question is uh, how much inspiration the dancers give you, Mark? Well, you always skip the part where they say, I love the show, thank you so much. <laughs> you don't translate that part to the, our broadcast public. It's like, and, that's and important to us. And she also love the show, by yeah, the way. Yeah, it starts with, I love the show. And what was your question? Oh, no, okay. Um, <clears throat> the dancers, it's about the dancers. Here's the thing, in, there, if there weren't dancers, guess what there wouldn't be? A show or a dance company. I would have these mad ideas and I could just think about them. Um, I choose not to. I don't make up dances in my head. I make up dances on the people I work with. I adore them, and we also work very, very closely, and some of it is absolutely determined and designed and it's very, very meticulously rehearsed and figured out, and it's brutal and difficult and takes a long time, and some of it is like, I like that. That's the dance. Do, it. Do that. Or I want it to look like something's happening, you know, the clouds are passing over the moon, go. And so all of that works. I work only with adults, can you imagine? They're great and they have a long career because th they're treated pretty well for a dance company. Let me just say single rooms on tour, which is a big luxury for dancers, as shocking as that might be. Health insurance, they're pay I pay them, it's not like they show up and dance, you know, it's not just a favor. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's a pretty humane schedule and I have a size company where if you don't want to talk to somebody, you can. There's enough people where you can have your own clique for a little while. But also, um, dancing is kind of great and I don't want to see just the tired, same old tired stuff night after night. And so I have people who have imaginations and uh, are literate and intelligent and responsible and kind of fun, that helps. And you know, there's a lot of time in airports and uh, hotels and you know, waiting for things. And you know, we realize that everyone tells us all the time, well, you're not in New York. It's like, well, I know, that's what I like, but it's also, the service could be a little bit faster sometimes. Surely not in London. Is there no. A, is there a, yes, up there, yes. You can sh shout, shout, yeah. So the question, she loved the show. Thank you, okay. Uh, the question is, do the colors in the costumes make you feel different? Lauren. Interesting. Um, you know, my job is to get out here and do what I do, so I think I would just do that, but I suppose it does do something. Um, we, we love, we love the vibrancy of the costumes, and and it does pep us up. And you know, it's the kind of show where when you're not in a section, you're not you don't just walk away. We're all watching each other and smiling, and and we it, we we. I think it's yes. I think it does affect us, as does uh, the music and having this kind of instrumentation, which is slightly unusual for us. When I'm hearing the saxophone and I'm hearing the theremin and I'm hearing our tenor, all of them. It's 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 not. I don't always dance to that. Um, and so yes, it's the it's. All of it, and it's Mark putting in these uh, mod steps, and uh, yeah, the reflection from the back. We're wearing sunglasses. Uh, it's entirely different from anything that we do, and I think that every dance Mark makes is like that. It's entirely different from any of the other things I've done, and that's why personally I've been here for <laughs> decades. <laughs> yeah, a really long time um, because it's not like doing the same show eight shows a week for 10 years. It's always different. Yeah, costumes are really important. Uh, for me, it's um, putting on a personality. Um, the, the kind of show that I'm going to give lives in the costume. Uh, for me, just like in my personal life, when I put on my cowboy boots, I'd rather strut than just walk down the street. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> I, I wish I owned a beautiful purple suit as the one that I have in the show. Uh, but it, it really does make me feel cool and puts me in the essence of the piece, in the atmosphere. Liz Kurtzman, who was the costume designer, of, and I, of course, researched colors, period, saturated colors. Somebody said, there's like 
there's some missing things, orange or something, thank God, who wants to watch orange? But I always think I can feel color by wearing it, which is why I wonder why every symphony orchestra that are usually men, and every, almost every third one is wearing one black sock and one like navy blue sock. And you would think if they're that sensitive aesthetically, musically, and that they'd be able to tell, but that's a hopeless case. So, so the question is, what, what happens in the rehearsal room? What is the process? What, what's the day-to-day -day making process? Oh, okay. Well, this, unfortunately, that answer will take eight hours, but I'll just tell you, the rehearsal, how it works in rehearsal, I know some of the music. I have maybe a few little plans. I come into the studio and I try things out with the dancers. And I see what works. I make up stuff. Even if it's going to be a solo, I work on it with everybody so that I have that material, that physical material that I can move around. And you, you'll see, obviously, there are thematic motifs, motives that reappear throughout the piece that to tie it together to make it uh, make it more watchable and more sort of continuous to make a through line of the piece. So everybody basically, everyone in the dance knows every single move that everyone is doing at all times. So consequently they can fill in for someone who's injured or throwing up or something like that. And it gives a, a, a holism to the piece. So everything together, stressing again, live music, live audience, live dancing, instant decisions being made at this exact moment. Perfect ending to a perfect evening. Um, sorry. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and I uh, hope you have a great tour around the UK. And uh, thank you for coming. And thank you to all those people out there in Facebook land as well. Thank Tell you. Tell your friends. Yep. <laughs>